This is the entrance to the uh, Sacred Way, which closes at 5.30, we think. So we're hoping they let us in up ahead. Yeah, those people just walk through. They're letting people through. And then it's 1.3 uh, miles, I think, about to walk the general portion of it that's lined with statues. Which is what you want to see. The rest is uh, just a road. So I think once we get in there, we uh, can walk to the end. They probably close the gates at 5.30 and then takes you about a half hour to walk. We took the 872 bus from uh, Ding Ling tomb. Didn't have time to do Jo Ling, which is okay. I don't think there was much to see at it, although it is restored and excavated somewhat. Um, the uh, stop we got off the bus at the north end here is uh, Hu Zhuang, and then we'll go down to uh, Dogong Men. Great Palace Gate. Good, and we got 15 minutes to spare. I thought we would never get here. That bus was going so slow. <coughs> so we're at the Ling Shing Gate. Spirit Way. We'll go down here to the Great Palace Gate. Dagong Men. The last bus to Beijing is six. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. But we're probably not going to take the bus back because I think traffic will be killer. Easier to go back to the train, Qingping Station. Takes you into the Beijing North Railway Station. So. Situated at the foot of Tian Shan Mountains of Changping District, Beijing, the Ming Tombs is the cemetery of the 13 emperors of the Ming Dynasty. Covering an area of 80 square kilometers, it's about 50 kilometers away from Beijing city proper. Construction of the Ming Tombs started in 1409 and ended in 1644 when the Ming Dynasty collapsed. It took 200 plus years to build the Ming Tombs from beginning to end. 13 imperial tombs, although there are 16 tombs in total. So 13 of the 16 emperors are buried here. The extra three tombs are for concubines and a eunuch, believe it or not. Seven concubine tombs and a eunuch's tomb are scattered in the valley. This says there's more. The map doesn't quite up to what, add up to what the other museums have said at the different tombs. So maybe more than that would make 21 tombs. The Ming tombs is relatively cons well conserved. Compared with other Chinese imperial tombs, it boasts high historic and cultural values, etc., etc., restored by the government, founding of the People's Republic of China, promulgated, blah, blah, blah. Key national site, blah, blah, blah. UNESCO World Heritage Site as of 2003. So, we took the bus from the train station up to Qingling and did that first, and uh, then took the bus to D Dingling. And then we didn't have time for Zhou Ling. Now, the rest of them you can visit, they're open, but you gotta take a taxi or you've got to uh, walk and it's spread over 15 square miles, 40 square kilometers. So you really have to take a taxi. You may be able to walk from a few of them to each other, but then you would be risking not having a taxi to get home. So you have to rent the taxi for the day essentially, I think. The bus passed over Seven Arch Bridge. Um, in my last video, you can see that. And uh, we came through Dragon Phoenix Gate, and we'll pass by all the stone sculptures, a stele pavilion, the Red Gate. The dismounting stele is where the procession would get off their horses for the final walk up into the Valley of the Kings here. And uh, then down here, uh, we'll catch the bus back by the Stone Memorial Arch. 
the main sacred way of the Ming tombs is also called the Changling sacred way. Because all the passages derive from here, it's called the Chief Tomb Passage. Its construction began in the 10th year of the Emperor Xuandi and was reconstructed in the 19th year of Emperor Zhai Jing of the Ming Dynasty. The stone arch, the red gate, the monuments at both sides, the monument pavilion of Changling Saint, the stone statue, the Long Fang Gate, Long Fang Gate, gave the dragon and phoenix, five hole bridge, long as dragon, Fong is uh, phoenix. Five-hole bridge, seven-hole bridge, and other buildings spread from south to north, looking magnificent. Among them, the monument pavilion of Changling Saint, the stone statue, and the Long Fong Gate, Gave the Dragon and Phoenix, are the core architectures of the passage. The stone carvings, gravely modeled, accords with the solemn atmosphere commemoration of the tombs, and achieves a very high artistic level. <clears throat> so... Gonna have some notorious. We're gonna go through the officials and generals first. Supposedly, they have all the nine levels of civil office you could hold, is what I understand in the imperial system. Then we go through some uh, various uh, mythical and real life animals, all uh, crouching for the emperor as he passes, except the upp uppity camel there and I don't know some of them are standing not kneeling kind of weird right I guess every other one is standing not really no yeah every other one's standing so they got two of each maybe roof pillars then we go through some ornamental pillars and the Shengong Shengdi Stele Pavilion the south gate cool we made it. You got your uh, mask. You might want to wear it because <coughs> we're right between the roadways here. It's pretty f bad air quality. Okay. I got mine on. Today was not the greatest air quality day. So we had to change plans twice. The original plan was we were going to go hike 10 kilometers at uh, Mutan Yu, Great Wall, and I said to hell with that. You could barely see the mountains around the Ming tombs, you know, I'm not hiking 10 kilometers in air quality like this. Plus the rugged terrain that surrounds M Mutian Yu is the whole reason for going there. So then I thought, well, we could go to Bada Ling. Because that's the best restored version of the wall, but it's very crowded. But the trains were sold out by 9 a.m. There's a 902 train that leaves from the station. And I think we just missed it anyway, but they were sold out till the afternoon. So then the alternative plan, since we were at the train station already, the Beijing North train station, was to take the uh, train here to Chongping. And if we had extra time, go to Badaling. But we barely had time to see everything at uh, it was noon before we got to Changling so it's about a 40 minute ride we had to wait for the 1022 we got here at 11 to the train station by the time we got off on and off the bus up here it was then got our tickets and everything and walked through the gate it was just noon to uh, to Changling and then Changling had quite a bit to see we spent about an hour in the uh, museum there, in the main hall, climbed the spirit tower. Then we had to wait for the bus. We didn't even have time to have lunch. They give you a free lunch with the through ticket. <laughs> and uh, you should take a picture of the willows. It remind, you know what this reminds me of, right? What does it remind you of? Uh, Hangzhou? Yeah, Westlake. Yeah, it's very nice. The Willows? Yeah, very nice. Hey. Hold on. This one. Okay, one, okay, one two, two, three. Indian tourists, it looks like. Can I ask me the question why they do this separate 
Why? Okay, so <laughs> the emperors uh -huh. have a dynasty that lasts for 277 years. Mm -hmm. So they are able not just to build one tomb, they're able to build a tomb for almost every one of their emperors yeah, after yeah, they yeah. move the capital yeah. from Nanjing to here. Mm -hmm. So this becomes the Valley of the Kings. You, you know Egypt, the Valley of the Kings? Mm -hmm. It's the same thing. They the all... Valley of the King, that means they walk through all this way to appreciate how much uh, great contribution that those emperors has made to their country dynasty. Is it how well, essentially, it's essentially... Right? No, es <laughs> essen essentially, when you die and you have a lot of wealth, you want to be preserved, you know, because you think you're so important. <laughs> and you are, I guess, if you're the emperor, you're pretty important. But mainly because you have the money and manpower, you have a huge tomb built for yourself and stuffed with all sorts of goodies, all the stuff you had in life, you know, because there's this belief in the afterlife at that point, you know. Everyone wants to live forever in the afterlife, and so... They want to. They want to. They want to build a beautiful and safe uh, palace for themselves. Like you didn't get to walk through it um, at uh, Ding Ling, but there was an underground palace. And um, this is an underground palace. Yeah, that's what I went to when when I lost you. Oh no! But it's it wasn't that much to see. It's just some vaults, really. There's really nothing in it because they weren't sealed and the water leaked in. Mm -hmm. and ruined everything. So they had some replicas of the red uh, lacquer coffins. But there's really nothing to see besides mm -hmm. big barrel vault uh, chambers. Mm -hmm. Which are quite, they're quite impressive. But I think they actually built them, then covered them with earth. So I don't know if they're really underground, you know? Uh -huh. Because to get to them, you walk up a hill, up a mound, and then go into them. So what they probably did was excavate it down, built them, and then covered them with earth, you know? So, that's less impressive than if they actually were tunneling to build them, which I don't think they did. So, ba yeah, so basically the first emperor, like when we went to Qingling, Yang, yeah. Yangle, Yongle. Yongle, he builds his you know, a uh, tomb basically in like a Buddhist temple on a central axis with gateway, pavilion, great hall, and worship tower. And then his tomb is in back of it. Um, and then everybody copies him. And it becomes the style for imperial tombs and probably for high level officials for the next several hundred years. I haven't been to the eastern Han, eastern uh, Han to the uh, Ch the Qing tombs to the east in in Hebei province, mm -hmm. but I think they're 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 kind of the same thing essentially. So, you end up with this valley, where all the rulers of one dynasty are buried, and then the Manchu come through and they they destroyed some of the stuff at Dingling, but it was rebuilt in later years of the Manchu, like they're saying under Chien Long, he allowed some of the ancestors of the uh, Ming, who were, you know, directly related by blood, mm -hmm. to live at a household up here and maintain the graves. Really? Yeah. Oh, so into the Chien Long, right? Well, what happened when the Qing came in, what happened to a lot of the, the Ming aristocracy because you know if you have 16 concubines and you're the king you're gonna have a lot of sons right and some of those sons actually became emperor but they got worried when you know the Manchus came that if they asserted themselves too much they would be perceived as a threat and killed or put under house arrest so a lot of the the Ming um, arist aristocrats are very well, well educated mm -hmm. and they were living the life of an of a literati anyway so that a lot of them became recluses 
and Buddhist monks. And they lived in villas, uh, you know, off in the distance and did calligraphy and poetry and painting and lived at monasteries and that kind of thing. So, and I don't, I don't know, I don't know much about the history specifically of it, but I would guess a lot of them were allowed to keep a certain amount of land so that they, pr they probably would have been pretty well off because to maintain uh, all those tombs with guards, you know, and... I don't think so because I have uh, watched some TV program, but I'm not sure <coughs> exactly the same thing with the history, you know, but if a dynasty was turned over and yeah. a new dynasty is took in office, they will just do everything they can to kill the last emperors, you know. No, that's not, it's not really, to yeah. stop them to do anything because, I mean, it's not, there's uh, a one prince or from Ming Dynasty want to, you know, do some big forces to uh, get it back, the dynasty from Qing to Ming, yeah. things like that, yeah. That's not, that's not really, that's what I thought at first, like out with one dynasty and in with the other. Mm -hmm. But I think essentially, like when the Mongols came in, they kept a lot of the administrators who were Han. They kept a lot of the yeah, language they, and customs. They, they keep some. And a lot of the, a lot of the lower level, a lot of the lower level aristocracy probably just would have been required to say, we recognize you as the king now. And that would have given the king legitimacy, you know? So, I don't know. I don't know exactly how, how it worked out, but I think a lot of them, let's check this out. I think a lot of them probably were able to live, you know, as monks and that kind of thing. As long as they didn't do anything like build an army. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then nobody... I remember there's a one prince built, trying to build an army and against the Qing dynasty. Yeah. It's always happening. Ah, so it's been 10 years. So this is a year old, this exhibit, because they were UNESCO World Heritage Site since 2003. So they have some photos here that show. This is the end. We should go that way. Okay. Whoa, slippery. There's mold there. Algae. 27th session, UNESCO World Heritage Committee in Paris. They inscribed them into the World Heritage List as the expansion project. I wonder if this is when they did all the garden and gardens in Sujo. The UNESCO World Heritage List kind of has become too inclusive, you know. When I was in Suzhou, every garden I went to was a UNESCO World Heritage <laughs> Site. But that is great. That is great. I guess so. But once, if you're gonna make a list that includes everything, then it's like, why well, make a list at all, you know? Honey, go to the store and buy me everything. W <laughs> would you really need to write everything down? He would. He would just buy everything, right? You need to talk to the UNESCO. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's still pretty selective. You can't just get in there for anything, but. See, we came over this bridge, and then there was all those people down in the gardens here. Mm. The Seven Arch Bridge, and now we're here, about halfway. 277 years. This actually gives you a better view, doesn't it? Mm. Of some of the stuff that we saw in the museum than actually looking. This is what you missed. Not a whole lot. Mm. The red, the rear chamber. So you go underground and you go into the side chamber, then you go into the main chamber, and then running perpendicular at the end is the rear chamber, and that's where the coffins were, they think. Mm -hmm. But it got water damage and destroyed everything. Plus the Red Guard came through and looted and burned everything in the Cultural Revolution. So not a whole lot's been left. But it's impressive. It's a big space. I mean... 
You could have a uh, basketball game down there. Really? Yeah, it's huge. Zhao Ling, this is what we didn't get to go to today. Zhou Ling. Mm. So it looks like a lot of the same of what we saw at Chain Ling. This is why it's unique though, they say, because it has this wall and back is still intact. So that's what's unique about this one. I wonder if our tickets will be good to go through that last one if we come back tomorrow. Or they're only good for one day. No, you can't use it tomorrow. You can or you can't? You can't. Can't, yeah. Minister of Merit, Star Worshipping Gate, Changling, Changling, Stone Archway. Mayor of Beijing, Executive Vice Mayor. <coughs> Railings fixed on the sides of the road. Lots of improvement projects, huh? They've done a pretty good job with this attraction. I think the main problem with getting here is that you have to interface with so many buses back and forth, you know? Like you saw how choked with traffic it was. They should almost make a special train like at Bottling, you know? Like a spur off the uh, station at, what's it called there? Chongping. Normally they would suggest that... Uh, take the bus from Beijing here? No, take the uh, train from Beijing to Bottling and then come to uh, main term afterwards and then we return back that would i can't imagine doing that unless you get up super early and leave yeah, leave it like again. you'd have to leave it like 6 a.m mm. to do everything and you'd be so tired and you would see so little it wouldn't be worth it you know <clears throat> this is when they repair the bridge one two three four five that's a different bridge Those those tour groups that we saw going through, like you get good value for your money when you travel with a huge group of people, but you see so little, like such a whirlwind. It's crazy. Like I did a trip like that in high school where we had ten days in Europe and we went to <clears throat> I don't know, like six or seven countries, and you feel like you see a lot, but looking back on it now that I've traveled on my own. I realized how little we saw and how much time we spent on a bus. And I think, you know, how silly it was. But I guess if you only have like a two week vacation and you want to see a lot, it's a good thing, good way to do it. Do you know what these are? Yeah, best wishes. Whatever people make a, pra a prayer yeah, they write yeah. their prayer on it yeah. and attach it to the gate yeah. they were doing this at a lot of the Buddhist and Shinto shrines in uh, Japan too yeah. and they have like their year that they were born on it their totem animal I think no Bought it from a shop, yeah. They didn't make that themselves. See, this is the one that has goat feet, the body of something, the head of something, and the tail of something. Yeah, there's like all these different mythical creatures. It gets confusing. Be that's either a chilin or a chilin, chilin yeah. <coughs> yeah, I'll take your photo. Photograph. Do you want the kneeling one or the big, the big standing one? Because uh, those ones are kneeling. Yeah. Okay. You want the kneeling or the big one? Kneeling. You could sit on his, uh, his paw. Yeah. And then you can tell people that <laughs> you walked on the sacred way, and an elephant 
was bending down and you sat on his hoof. And they'll go, really? And you go, yep. And they'll go, wow. And then you'll just, you'll just smile because you won't be lying. But they won't ask if it was a real live elephant or not. <laughs> I think they should be bent like this rather than this one. I don't know how elephant would actually... It's very weird to say like this. Right? You know, elephants actually... Like this. Elephants actually were as far, lived as far north as Beijing in ancient time. Or probably up until like pretty recently. Yeah. Okay, ready? One, two... I think I got a good one. Check it out. Thank you. Is that good? Good? One more? One more? One more? Yeah. I'll do it. Because I closed my eye, I think. Okay. And I want the whole big one. You want all of it? Yeah, all of it. All right. You want the trees and the camels? Let me do it this way. Right. Ready? One, two, three. Okay. Yep. Thank you. I think that one should be better. Mm. Yeah. Good? Much better. Good. Cool. Okay, let's go. Mm. <laughs> You know what kind of camel these are? Uh, camel. <laughs> They're the camel with two humps is called in English we say a Bactrian camel. Bactrian. Bactrian. B A C T R I A N. It's the kind that lives in uh, the steppes uh, and in uh, to Saudi Arabia, right? And if you look at the humps it looks like a bee on its side. Mm -hmm. So that's how you can remember that it's a Bactrian camel because it's a, got a bee. Two humps like a bee. Because the other kind of camel has one hump. Only one? Yeah. Oh, three. Oh, oh, oh. No, there's, there's only camel with one hump. And the camel with one hump is called a dromedary camel. Oh. So it looks like a D on its side. Mm -hmm. It's a really easy way to remember <laughs> the different ones. I think this is the right pose of Nian. For a camel it is. Yeah, but that elephant thing is very weird. I don't know. I think a, I think an elephant can kneel on its uh, knees if it wants to because I've seen them do it in uh, circles. They, they won't need it like they're bundling their head forward. They need to bundle their head backwards, you know. I've seen, I've seen them, I've seen elephants in a uh, circus with their, on their knees like you're saying. But I think I'm. I don't. I don't. I don't know for sure. But I think they can also do it. Do it the other. Do it. Do it the way they're showing it there, maybe. But I don't know. I don't know. I don't think so. The way you light up my life. Where was that? Was that last night on Nanlu Gu that was playing? by when we walked by one of the bars because I had it in my head all day. What is it? I forgot. <laughs> it's, it's some stupid pop song from America. Oh. And it was in my head all day. I was like really annoyed. <laughs> now this is a what? Uh, Again, it's a chilin. Uh, looks like chilin but... Because it's got the hooves of a goat, the body of a horse, the head of a dragon, and I think the tail of a donkey is what I've read. In ancient Rome, they have uh, tombs that they would line along the roadways leading out of the city. Because, mainly because there was a law against burying dead people within the city walls because it was unhealthy. Mm. Mainly that's why they did it. But it also became like a way that people would remember you because they, they were forced to pass by you 
pass by you. So if you were wealthy enough, you would erect a huge, you know, um, mausoleum, uh, mortuary, some kind of mortuary architecture along the roadway. So people would notice it and come by and your servants and your freemen and your family would offer sacrifices. So it's a, it's a pretty much it's a universal. This whole thing is a universal concept. You see it in ancient Egypt. You see it in ancient Rome. You see it here in Asia. There's lions. Lions. Yeah. They look so much like dogs the way they do lions in uh, Chinese art. I told you what we call these, right? Sometimes in English they call them foo dog. F F O O D O G foo dog, okay. like a dog. Um, That's what I always heard it called when I would go to Chinatown as a kid. <laughs> foo dog, and one would have a ball under its paw, and one would have a baby. The male had the ball, and the female had the baby. I always thought it was kind of neat. I'm glad that we are here right now because there's not much people around, you know. Yeah, this was a good way to do it. Yeah. See, remember you said, really? You want to go to Ching Ling first? <laughs> and I said, yeah, I think that's the better way to do it. <laughs> We're only about halfway, though. What are these columns? Cloud, clouds and mountains? Yeah, it looks like clouds and mountains with dragons and umbrellas. Cloud umbrellas and a dragon. And probably phoenix at the top. What's it say? Yeah. Have you ever ridden on a camel? Uh, do you want to explain some of this? Yeah, sure. Camel is a symbol for the ark in desert, living in a very vast, broad desert, and it stands for that the emperor has, you know, conquered a very huge place in the. Uh, Xinjiang area. Right. Yeah. The Uyghur. The Uyghur. Uyghur. What else? I don't think there's much more interesting. No? no? Don't say anything more. Lion is the king of the animal. Unresistible and have a very strong power. Oh, sounds familiar. And it says that the lion simplifies the uh, supreme power of imperial family. Okay. Cool. Anything else? There are uh, orchards all around here, so you want to look out for seasonal fruit and vegetable stalls on the main road. I saw plenty of them. Mostly apples. I saw some pumpkins. Did you see those pumpkins on, when we were on the bus? There was a, fru a food stall selling fruit, seasonal fruit. And they had huge pumpkins. They were huge. Is it real pumpkins? Yeah, they were for sale. They were from the orchards around here. Because remember you were saying that this area is real good for orchards and everything? Stone statues and animals. Emperor Zheng Tong. Zheng Tong. Zheng Tong. Zheng Tong. Zheng Tong of the Ming Dynasty. The stones were collected from Dushu Stone Field in Fangshan, Beijing. Altogether, there are 36 stone statues and animals. From south to north, they are lion, shiji, camel, elephant, kailin, horse, 
military officials, civil officials, and honored official. The tradition of placing stone statues in front of the tomb started from Chin and Han dynasties or even earlier. It is a decoration and it's also the symbol of the status of the dead. The types of statues vary according to different dynasties and different owners of the tombs. This group of stone statues in Changling adopted the system of Xiaoling, Emperor Zhu Yuanzhong's tomb, the first emperor of the Ming dynasty, and four honored officials were added which can better display the dignified manner of the Ming emperors. Cool. Makes perfect sense now. You gotta go to the party? It's time to go to the party. Y'all use the bathroom too. Toilets. I'm gonna keep recording the whole time. No. Sometimes I record a video and I record the stream of my own urine. Yeah, oh my I record, so I, re I record too. everything, wow. everything. <laughs> the station takes you into the Beijing North Railway Station. So, situated at the foot of Tian Shan Mountains of Changping District, Beijing, the Ming Tombs is the cemetery of the 13 emperors of the Ming Dynasty. Covering an area of 80 square kilometers, it's about 50 kilometers away from Beijing city proper. Construction of the Ming tomb started in 1409 and ended in 1644 when the Ming dynasty collapsed. It took 200 plus years to build the Ming tombs from beginning to end. 13 imperial tombs, although there are 16 tombs in total. So 13 of the 16 emperors are buried here. The extra three tombs are for concubines and a eunuch, believe it or not. Seven concubine tombs and a eunuch's tomb are scattered in the valley. This says there's more. The map doesn't quite up to what, add up to what the other... And we got 15 minutes to spare. I thought we would never get here. That bus was going so slow. <coughs> so we're at the Ling Shing Gate. Spirit Way. We'll go down here to the Great Palace Gate. Dagong Men. The last bus to Beijing is six. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. But we're probably not going to take the bus back because I think traffic will be killer. Easier to go back to the train. Qingping museums have said at the different tombs. So maybe more than that would make 21 tombs. The Ming tombs is relatively cons well conserved compared with other Chinese imperial tombs. It boasts high historic and cultural values, etc., etc. Restored by the government, founding of the People's Republic of China, promulgated, blah, blah, blah. Key national site, blah, blah, blah. UNESCO World Heritage Site as of 2003. So. We took the bus from the train station up to Qingling and did that first and uh, then took the bus to D Dingling and then we didn't have time for Zhouling. Now the rest of them you can visit, they're open, but you got to take a taxi or you've got to uh, walk and it's spread over 15 square miles, 40 square kilometers. So you really have to take a taxi. You may be able to walk from a few to about a half hour to walk. We took the 872 bus from uh, Ding Ling tomb. Didn't have time to do Zhou Ling, which is okay. I don't think there's much to see at it, although it is restored and excavated somewhat. Um, the uh, stop we got off the bus at the north end here is uh, Hu Zhuang, and then we'll go down to uh, Daogong Men, Great Palace Gate. This is the entrance to the uh, Sacred Way, which closes at 5.30, we think. So we're hoping they let us in up ahead. Yeah, those people just walk through. They're letting people through. And then it's one uh, point 
three miles, I think, about to walk the general portion of it that's lined with statues, which is what you want to see. The rest is uh, just a road. So I think once we get in there, we uh, can walk to the end. They probably close the gates at 5.30 and then take